Hi guys, hope you're well. I just had a couple thoughts about kind of, I wanna say about the crack up boom, which is a idea from Ludwig von Mises that talks about kind of a, a, a late stage or the beginning stages of a, kind of a severe inflationary period where you have something called Gresham's Law that starts to take hold of the psyche of the general population. And so basically Gresham's Law is, the quick version is the, the bad money chases out the good money. And what that kind of means is you've got all of this money that's being created that people see as less and less valuable or having less and less purchasing power. And when I mean uh, money, you know, I'm talking about currency, of course, or in this case, let's say dollars. And this is what kicks this is what the catalyst to a severe inflationary time. Uh, this is usually what the catalyst looks like. That's what I'm trying to say. And, you know, I was having this discussion with Bob Murphy yesterday on that, on the video, on the chat that we had. And I can't recall if it's when we were recording or when we were um, just kind of, chatting back and forth but got me thinking about that time frame in weimar germany prior to their hyperinflation and if you guys haven't watched the whiteboard video or videos i've done on that time frame what i'm referring to specifically is the real parabolic devaluation of the i believe it was the reichmark um, came in 1923 and I was reading some statistics on how severe it was and I don't have the exact numbers right off the top of my head but or right in front of me but right off the top of my head it was something like at the beginning of 1922 or in the middle of 1922 this was just prior, this is right when the hyperinflation was starting to, to take hold, okay? The total number of German currency units, it's called a marks, in the planet, anywhere, inside Germany, outside Germany, the total number of marks on the planet Earth in existence at that time, if you took all of them and put them in uh, the central bank or something and counted them, you would have a value or a, a nominal value that is equivalent to about, I think the number was roughly 180 billion. So the total of all Reichsmarks or marks outstanding at let's say 1922 was 180 billion. A little over one year later, one year, not 100 years, one year later, it would have cost you around 180 billion marks to buy a newspaper. Let that sink in. So using today's terms, if we look at M2 money supply, and obviously there are a lot more dollar denominated commercial bank liabilities that exist outside of M2 money supply, which you know we've learned from Jeff Snyder. But let's just say that all the dollars in existence right now 
are reflected in the M2 money supply number, which is, I, I believe last time I checked is roughly uh, 20 trillion, something like that. Maybe 18, 19. Let's just say it's 20 trillion. Just imagine what it would look like not just the United States, but the entire world. If in one year from today, one year, 12 months, it cost $20 trillion to buy a newspaper. Better hope you've got some 30 year fixed rate debt. <laughs> So let's go back to kind of these anecdotal stories. You know, when you start to study history, and I, I didn't, I, I, during the last, call it eight years, when I've really started to get into macro, once I retired, I would study history a little bit, but not. To, not to a great degree. What really fascinated me is always how things work. So when you see like the repo spike, remember that back in September of uh, 2019? At that time, I really didn't understand the repo market. Uh, I hadn't looked into it. But when I started to look into it, boy, I was completely consumed just trying to figure it out. It was just, it was like a fascinating puzzle, just trying to put all the pieces together to figure out well, this repo market thing, what is going on here? It's the dollar funding market. This is the plumbing of the global financial system. This is where the majority of dollars uh, come from. I, I don't, you know, what is going on here? So that's very, very interesting to me. Many times, just going back in history, it's just you're, you're reading about stuff that happened in the past, which is pretty cool, but it doesn't grab my attention, like trying to figure out how something works, like quantitative easing or uh, the repo market or how, how the creation of money works or something. But lately, I've really been drawn to history because we are potentially living in unprecedented times. Uh, maybe not globally, we've seen this play out potentially, but maybe here in the United States, uh, now whether we get this severe inflation or a deflationary bust or just a deflationary bust in asset prices while consumer prices go up, I'm not sure. But something's got to give. And that's kind of what this video is about. Yeah, the fourth turning. Yeah, I think that's, a book that we should all be focusing on right now, The Fourth Turning and The Road to Serfdom by, by Hayek. But let me go over some of the, the anecdotal stuff that that is really grabbing my attention and it's making me pause or take pause and say, wait a minute here, is this, is this the end game? Is, is the end game playing out right in front of our eyes. Is this what it looks like? Is this, is this how it starts? Is this how, what did it look like in Germany in 1921 and 22? Another thing that I would point out that I found shocking is prior to the hyperinflation of 1923, if you look at a year and a half prior, basically, the German currency, it's called the mark, actually appreciated in value against the dollar. It went up. So you see, it, it's not like they had all of these warning signs of hyperinflation. They thought, and, and a lot of others, a lot of economists across the globe thought that Germany had discovered or had created an economic miracle in 1920, 1923, because a lot of the other global economies went into a depression. 
such as the United States. As most of you guys know, we had a significant depression where the headline numbers were almost just as bad as the 1930s. And that hit around 1920, if my memory serves me right. And uh, so Germany, just their economy taking off, similar to maybe how our economy is taking off right now. Everyone wanted to invest in Germany in 19, 20, 21. Everyone wanted to come in. They were, again, an economic miracle. How could they do this? This was just incredible. You, I remember reading stories about people traveling to Germany in 1920 and seeing all the shops fill and the cafes bustling and people going to restaurants and having good times and this hustle and bustle of the economy and it's just it, they they everyone was writing about it like they just couldn't believe how amazing it was compared to the devastation the economic devastation they were seeing in other countries like the united states and what does this do well then the banks started to lend aggressively let's say and this as we know is a major driver or the, the main creator of additional currency units is the creation of loans through the commercial banking system. So you had all of this euphoria and the commercial banks got involved and that's what really triggered the hyperinflation is, uh, is that combined with people's attitude really, really shifting. And when I was talking to Bob, Yesterday, one of the things that we discussed is his, I don't want to say prediction, but how, what he sees in the future as far as inflation, if he sees it being a big problem. And he does, but he openly admits that he was a little off. Uh, he, got the, he got the asset inflation correct back in 2010, but he thought the CPI, even as measured by the government, would be above 10%. Um, and now the big change, of course, is the amount of dollars that are being created in the real economy, but also, maybe more importantly, the psychological shift, right? And yesterday, or last night, a couple things here. Let me go ahead and write this down so I don't forget. But I'll go over kind of my story about this truck I just bought that where I started to, to think about Gresham's law and it just hit me like a ton of bricks. And as most of you guys know, I uh, back when I was helping out my, my uh, family member, uh, I, I spent the majority of 2017, I believe it was, in Tucson. And as a hobby, I started uh, flipping these trucks. I, it was just it was a lot of fun. I really enjoy it. And it's, it's like an Easter egg hunt, <laughs> but you're making like an extra 20 or 30 grand as a side hustle a month. But, and I like the trucks too. But anyway, I need a, a, a car for the next, call it four or five months in Florida or wherever I end up after Rebel Capitalist Live. And so, you know, why not buy a truck? Why, why rent a car? Why buy a car that's going to depreciate when I know those trucks so darn well, and I know how to buy them right, and I know how to make money on the buy side, why not just buy one of those and uh, you know buy it from a motivated seller, just like you guys, just like we always talk about on this channel, but with real estate, same thing, and then just drive it for six months, and then if I have to leave the country, and you know at the end of the year, then I'll sell it on eBay and I'll make five or six grand just for driving the truck around. You know, why not? That's, it makes a lot of sense. So anyway, I found a truck, by the way, I'll show you guys. It's, uh, it's just being shipped out from Arizona, rust free. It's been in California and Arizona its whole life. A 1997 F-250 uh, four wheel drive, of course, as you guys can guess, the 7.3 power stroke. <laughs> 
<laughs> and it's only got about 100,000 miles on it. And uh, it's a cream puff, one owner. The guy bought it brand new in 1997. And he's got every single record uh, for maintenance uh, the, of the truck's entire life. And so uh, anyway, I, he was a really great guy. And I got a, a good deal on it. And I love driving it. Maybe when I sell it, I'll make a little bit of money. But my point is this. I've been looking at comps on eBay, trying to determine what price I'd be willing to pay. And since I started buying these trucks, and as you guys know, I've got quite a few in storage as well. Um, the prices have just gone through the roof. I mean, uh, the prices have doubled almost. Uh, in some cases, they've, they've more than doubled. Uh, and this is just in the last couple of years. I mean, it's staggering, absolutely unbelievable. And I got to thinking about the truck I was just telling you about. And I was like, okay, well, in January, I'll go ahead and, or maybe in December, I'll sell it. But then I got to thinking, you know what? It, even if I sell it, like, let's say I can sell it for, uh, let's just say 30 grand, right? What what am I going to do with the 30 grand? Like, just try to buy another truck if I spend more time in the United States in a year that's double the price again? Like, why wouldn't I just not sell the truck and just put it in storage? Therefore, whenever I come back to Arizona to visit my friends or, um, or you know, hang out with people I know, then uh, I've just got a truck there. I've just got basically a rental car there to drive. And why would I sell it and just buy it back again for twice the price? And it doesn't make any sense. And then it hit me. I'm like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. This is Gresham's Law. My thought process right now is, is Gresham's Law. It's a total shift. You see, back in um, 2017, let's say, my thought process would have been, sure, I'll go ahead and sell it in six months. I'll, I'll pocket the you know, five, six grand or whatever, however much you make in profit. And then when I come back a year later, I'll just buy another one because then I can get another one super cheap. Then I can sell it and make another five grand in profit. And then I can drive a different truck. But now I've got a completely different mindset. Now, I don't think I can ever get that truck again. I might be able to, but it would be incredibly difficult to get a truck like that. So now, instead of just buying and selling, now I'm, I'm just buying. That's it. Because I don't want the dollars. I'd rather have the asset. I'd rather have the truck. You see? And so what happens is if, if all I'm doing and let's just assume that all of society did that to the point where all they're doing is buying. They're not selling. And look at what's happening to the real estate market right now, right? The inventory is, is staggeringly low. Why? Because very few people are selling but everyone is buying, you see? Well, what happens if everyone, let's just say that everyone right now had a million dollars cash in their bank account, and they decided that, uh-oh, I, I, I have a mind shift here. I need to start buying, but not selling. So what they're doing is they're trading those currency units over here on my left, let's say. They're trading these currency units for stuff. So those currency units go out into the economy. The stuff stays with them. But the people who are accepting the currency units are doing the exact same thing where they don't want them as much as they want stuff. So everyone is trying to collect stuff and maybe inadvertently, they're not even thinking about it consciously, but they're collecting 
stuff and getting rid of currency units. That's Gresham's law. And I think people right now, and I, I know I fell into that trap and I didn't even realize it. So I think people are doing it maybe subconsciously right now. But what happens when people start to do it intentionally or it's not subconscious? Now they're consciously going out and doing it. I don't know. And where it gets very complex is when you juxtapose that idea with the understanding that the commercial banking system, which is generally in charge or has control over the dollar, the amount of dollars in the real economy through lending and then people paying off loans. So the, the amount of dollars being created by the commercial banking system is going down. You see, therefore the amount of dollars being produced by the commercial banking system is going down. Well, at the same time, the dollars being produced by the government, the Fed, is obviously going up. Euro dollar system, commercial banking system going down. Then you've got potentially people trading their dollars for, for goods subconsciously. Then maybe that transitions into something more consciously that gets velocity increasing. So then what then the trigger to a serious inflationary event here in the US would go back to the banks, which was very similar from what I can tell, is very similar to what happened in 1920 and 21, where the banks saw this what people perceived to be a booming economy which is what you see every single time you go to the CNBC homepage, right? Our economy is on fire. Our economy, that's our biggest problem is that the economy is just gonna to run too hot. It's too explosive. Our economy is growing too quickly. It's too much of a boom. We can't even handle the incredible economic boom we're experiencing. Maybe the banks see that and they say, hey, we want in. Instead of lending less, now we're going to lend more. If they lend more, that increases the amount of dollars. I don't know. I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm saying these are the things that uh, I'm thinking through. So I, I think that it may behoove you to give it some consideration. Because there are a lot of cross currents here. Anyone that says definitively we're going to have deflation or inflation just 100%, <laughs> I don't know, man. Uh, that's that's a pretty bold call because there, there's uh, this is like predicting the weather. You know, th this is this is definitely a game of probabilities. That's for sure. The one thing I, I do know for certain though well i shouldn't say certain but one thing I'm, I'm pretty confident in is that it 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 really doesn't end well because of the economic distortions i'm seeing that are are completely blowing me away so let me tell you that story last night we were at dinner and uh i was having dinner with hartman and uh and actually hartman's mom who's in, awesome real estate investor in her own right and uh some guys that are in the real estate business locally in fort myers and they were we were talking about local restaurants and they were saying that one of their favorite restaurants and i, I can't recall the name but they went down to only being open six days a week and so we said oh wow that's that, that's terrible. What are, what are they, they're not getting any business 
Is their business suffering because of the lockdowns or, or what happened in 2020 or something? And they're like, oh, no, no, no. No, their business is booming. Okay, well, if their business is booming, why are they deciding to only open six days a week? Why are they uh, closing their operations one day a week? That, that doesn't make any sense. And they said, because they can't find any employees. Think about that one. The, the, the restaurant we were at in, in downtown Fort Myers we were, was wildly understaffed. They, I mean, you had to wait a half an hour just to order. I, I mean, and, and it's, it's not like, you know, there's a, a long waiting, uh, a, a long line to wait or something. It was just they, they didn't have enough people. They, they couldn't get people to work. I, and then once we got on this topic, I started to talk to Hartman about it. And I guess uh, he was at a, some sort of conference or hotel. Um, I, I don't recall where it was, but it was, you know, it was a nice hotel. It was like a, a Westin or something like that. And this was just maybe a, a week or two ago. Oh, in fact, it was just this week because he was at a mastermind group. I think that's what it was. And, and, and again, this is in Florida, which is, one of the, the good states, <laughs> you know, and he said that the uh, coffee shop there was could only get one person to work, literally not one person at a time, just one employee. <laughs> That's it. So they were not only closed like after noon or one o'clock or something like that, but even when they were open. Hartman said that the, the one person who was uh, was there, you know, was, was gracious enough to actually come into work, was so busy making all of the coffee that they couldn't, they didn't even have time to run the cash register. So what happened is they turned it into this thing that was like, it was on the honor system. So what you would have to do is you'd have to, you'd have to give your order to the gal or, or guy there that would make the coffee. And then they had just like a, a tip jar basically. And you would have to just put in however much money it was like on the, he said it was like the honor system where you just have to put in as much money as, as you thought you owed. And there was no one really checking it. And hopefully you got it right. And if we owe you change or you owe us a little, we'll, we'll just call it good. Here's your coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Are you kidding me? Same thing at the restaurant he went to at the same hotel. It was nearby. It was for the same event last week. They, you know, he goes in there and uh, I forgot, you know, it took him a while to order or something like that. And he talked to the manager He's like, you know, what's going on? It's, it's taking us like a half hour, 45 minutes to, to order. He says, sir, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We're just incredibly understaffed right now. We just can't get anyone to work. You know, think that through. How, how does that end well? So... Then the, the individuals that um, we were with, these guys are, are real estate pros and they are just, I mean, it's, they're like printing money. I mean, you've got all these people that are not working because the government is paying them to stay home, but it's not like they're going from making three grand a month to 30 grand a month, right? They might be going from making three grand a month to four thousand a month, something like that, which is enough to, to incentivize them to not go to work. But you've got on the flip side of the coin, all these guys that are are in business and some people in business are just making an astronomical amount of money, almost to where it's like it's not even hard. Like every single thing they buy, they can just sell it two weeks later for 
you know, a 20% markup. Just buy, 20, mark it up 20% and sell it a month later. And because the market goes up so fast, there's just always a buyer there that's going to pay a higher price than you pay. And the only challenge of the business is just finding enough stuff to buy. <laughs> so you think about that combined with maybe what we talked about at the beginning with Gresham's Law. And then you combine that with something I have never seen in the United States. I never thought I would see that in the United States. Where or I understand it's hard to find good employees. I get it. I totally get it. But a restaurant, a, a, a super busy major restaurant that just has to close their 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 doors because they just flat out can't get any employees at any price. I mean, what? I never thought I would see that, at least in the United States. And it's not like they're out there trying to find electrical engineers. It's not like they're out there trying to, to find software developers or heart surgeons. And for heaven's sakes, they're trying to find a waiter or a waitress. <laughs> and I'm not downplaying how, the, the skills that it takes to be a, a waiter or a waitress. But, but come on. I, I mean, there, there are a few more people that can do that job than electrical engineering, right? So just unbelievable. And then when you think about the fact that the wealth of society is measured by goods and services, I mean, we are creating dramatically good, oh, fewer, excuse me, goods and services. I and mean, it's almost impossible to get a reservation at a restaurant. Every place is packed. And the biggest problem they have is just getting employees that will actually accept a job and are willing to work. I mean, how? Do, what does that look like if we continue on this trajectory for the next three or four years? I mean, really, that puts you in a bad, bad, bad place. And it's and it's not just putting the average Joe and Jane in a bad place, you see? Even if you're someone that's got a, a, a good amount of, of money or savings or wealth, whatever word you want to use, this affects you just as much. Because, and I've said this on a few of my videos, and I'm sure a lot of you guys can relate. There's many people on this live stream, and we've got almost 600 people right now on the live stream, like 579 or whatever. I'm sure there's a lot of people on this live stream right now that, uh, that their portfolio is significantly larger now as far as the, the value than it was in 2019. But I would ask those people, honestly, do you, even though your portfolio is bigger now, do you have access to more goods and services or less goods and services? Because I know for me, I definitely fall into that category where my portfolio is is much larger now than it was in 2019. But yet I, I, I don't have access to anything. I don't have access to <laughs> a restaurant. I don't have access to an Uber. I've been trying to buy a car and outside of the trucks, right? I've been trying to buy like a, that's almost impossible. I'm trying to find a, a place to stay, you know, here in, in Naples, this area. You guys know that story. That, that was next to impossible. I mean, it's like, I, I'm much, much poorer now than I was in 2019, even though my portfolio is much larger. And so again, if, if we continue on this path, on this trajectory, what does that look like in five years? I mean, my goodness gracious. 
And it, I think what it looks like is, is crack up boom that Mises outlined. What's, what I struggle with is how you get to that point if the commercial banking system is creating fewer dollars. To, to, to Jeff's point, to Dr. Lacey Hunt's point, to Brent Johnson's point, I mean, I get it. And their, their argument makes a lot of sense. I just, what's weird is, is on paper that makes sense, but and it, that's the way it should happen, but yet everything I see is just pointing in the opposite direction. So as investors, that puts us in a, a very difficult position because things should deflate. Now I'm not saying prices, consumer prices should go down, but I am saying asset prices should go down if things stay, if the system stays the same. And I've talked a lot about that lately as well. The system in which the commercial banking system is responsible for creating the majority of dollars. Right now we've got this hybrid thing going on where the, the, the federal government is trying to fill the, the, the gap, if you will, uh, of, dollar, of fewer dollars being created by the euro dollar system by all this fiscal spending that the Fed is monetizing. So that's kind of this weird hybrid system. But you know, how long can that last? Will it get will it be permanent? A lot of you would say yes. I would lean in that direction, but maybe it's not, maybe it is, maybe they do more, maybe they do less. But when the system really changes is when the commercial banks are no longer responsible for the dollar or no longer control the dollar from a standpoint of the number of dollars in the real economy. And that is the big shift that uh, I think we will most likely see. Again, no certainties, only probabilities. And that's where you go to a central bank digital currency. And the central bank is responsible for creating those loans in the real economy that are creating the increase in supply of currency units and dollars. I think that because of these distortions that we're seeing play out in front of our own eyes and because of the political and societal narrative right now, they're going to try to quote unquote fix these problems, not with less government, but with more government. They're going to blame these problems on free market capitalism, and therefore they're going to try to micromanage it, and they're only going to exacerbate the problem. And it's just like quantitative easing. It's just like the GFC, where the Fed was one of the contributors, one of the main contributors of the, the crash itself, but yet they're the ones that everyone goes to to try to solve the problem. Like Jim Grant says, they are the arsonist as well as the firefighter. Could the euro dollar replace the dollar? It already has. The, the euro dollar, listen, and that's what Snyder says, and I totally agree. The world reserve currency is not the dollar. The world reserve currency is the euro dollar. So it's, it's basically, let me say that a different way. The, the, the global reserve currency is dollar denominated commercial bank liabilities in and outside of the United States. Yeah, all it is is just dollar denominated bank liabilities. That's all the reserve currency is. That's basically all fiat currency is in general. All it is is a bank liability. And once we get our heads around that, we can start to understand the global monetary system and where this is all headed, I think, much clearer. But I guess the, 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 I wanted to express those ideas because I think they'll be important moving forward. But I guess the main takeaway for, for this 
from this video above and beyond that is we, we just need to be cognizant of the fact that this is not a time where you can just set it and forget it <laughs> with your portfolio. This is not a time when you can just hire a financial planner that doesn't understand macro and very few do. I mean, very few go ahead and ask your, you know, next time just for fun, when you meet with your financial planner at, I don't know what, what little bank or what big bank or whatever, or what group, but just ask your financial planner how quantitative easing works. Just ask your financial planner how money is created. See what they say. <laughs> ask them why the short end of the curve, the yield curve, is basically pegged at zero. And once you get out past two years, the yield curve steepens dramatically. So ask them, what are your thoughts on that? But, uh, they're just going to stumble around and try to tell you something. They're just going to make up something to make them uh, seem like they're smart. But they don't get it. They, they don't have a clue what they're doing. They don't have a clue. The only thing they're doing is just regurgitating this playbook that has been used for the past 40 years of risk parity, the 60-40 portfolio, and just adjusting it by your age. That's the extent to their incredible insight and wisdom. <laughs> so I'm not here to make fun of financial planners. What I'm here to do is, what I'm here saying is don't, just delegate your thinking to someone that you know damn well doesn't understand the system. Don't do that. Uh, I, I wish you could. I wish you could just completely ignore this and focus on your kids and enjoying your friends and going to church on the weekends or watching the football game or you know enjoying going hiking or the outdoors or any of the hobbies you have. I wish that's what life could be. But right now, if you choose to ignore what's going on with macro and on the bigger stage, unfortunately, I think over the long run, you're going to be a financial victim. So just pay attention like most of you are. I know I'm preaching to the choir, and that's why we've got 678 people on this live stream. Uh, because they're they're focused on this in their own lives, but uh, you know, keep it up. And 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 I would study what happened in in Weimar Germany, and I would read Hayek and uh, the Fourth Turning, and really start to put the pieces of the puzzle together and come up with the probabilities yourself, and use that critical thinking that we've been talking about so much on this channel uh, to your advantage. So, all right, guys, let me go ahead and do some shout outs and I'm going to get back to work. I'm working on a project for uh, myself and, and Hartman and, uh, and Ken McElroy. We're actually uh, partnering up on a deal that uh, I've been working on all morning. Okay, who do we have here? We've got uh, the angriest puppy in the house. We've got Pork Barrel Investing, Jared Smith, RR, FNS. El Chomio, Tacticus1979, cool name, Travis Jacobs. Guy Fambro, Thomas H, Mark Tur, Mark Tur. I think I'm getting that. Ann Cooper, Becky B, none of your bees wax. <laughs> Christina Church, Chris Dever, 86, Jay Liano. Brendan O'Brien, Ralph Nart Martinez, All Nighter Hider, Alan Zibelman, Ken Long, the angry, I think I said the angriest puppy. If not, I'll say it again. He's always here. I appreciate your support. Pork Barrel Investing, another person that's always on here. James, Wayne Smith, 
Wayne Smith, Mark Horseman, Yaren, Robert Rascon, Emilio Mack, <laughs> one of my favorite movies, Night at the Roxbury. Okay, guys, uh, enjoy the rest of your day, your weekend. I, I don't know if I'll do another live stream today. Kind of rare I do them on the weekends. But uh, we'll see you soon. If, if I don't do one today, I'll see you on the normal live stream I do on the George Gammon channel tomorrow evening at, uh, I think it's maybe 7.30 uh, p.m. Eastern. See you then, guys.